from uh, right on this campus. Um, Karen Hammerman is a PhD in philosophy from the University of Washington and is also the philosopher in residence at John Muir Elementary School um, in South Seattle, as well as a lecturer here at the University of Washington, where she teaches courses on animal welfare and philosophy for children. Uh, she's also taught philosophy at NOVA, which is a local alternative high school. Uh, and organized philosophy for children workshops on Bainbridge uh, for teachers, um, as well as running uh, philosophy sessions for interesting parents. So I will hand the floor over to Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Children from low income families. 
Uh, there's approximately 400 students at the school. 84% are kids of color. Um, nearly 50% identify as black or African American. 69% of the kids are on free or reduced price meals. 10% special education, 35% transitional bilingual students, 16% white. It's a very diverse population of students with really diverse needs. Um, there's 31 classroom teachers, uh, 22 of them are white. And it's a school where many students face the challenges of structural racism and economic marginalization. So it's a, uh, um, there's a lot going on. So, given that this is the program, this is where I'm working, I thought I would talk a little bit about building a philosophical community through this philosopher in residence program. So one of the things that becomes possible is creating these deep relationships with teachers, because I've been there for such a long time, and um, I work with them so closely. And so they've grown to trust me to handle their students with care and compassion. And I've grown to understand the way they run their classrooms so that you know, a few weeks ago, I was in my fourth grade class, one of them, and I said, and while the kids were doing group work, I sidled over to the teacher and I said, this is weird. She said, oh, yeah, that's because two days ago, 10 of them got in a huge fight at recess and like, beat each other up. And I have had, there was a substitute teacher that day, and she said, I have had words with them. And we're working through it. Right? And so I was able to sort of have that conversation with her and then adjust my work accordingly, right? But, but one of the only reasons I knew it was weird in there is because I know those kids really well and I know that teacher really well, right? Uh, and that really helps. It also means that we can work together as a team to make philosophy as rich an experience as possible. So I had a fourth grade teacher who early in the year told me that she was getting really frustrated in philosophy sessions because her students we're not engaging with each other's ideas. Right? So all of us who do this work know we have this problem, right? The kids put their hands up and they're just interested in sharing their idea. The college students too, let's face it, right? Put up their hand, they just want to share their idea, they don't want to engage with the other idea, right? So I have a no hands up while other people are talking policy when I do philosophy, um, both at the college level and the elementary level. Um, but she was still getting frustrated because they just weren't engaging very well with each other. And so we were able to talk about this, right, and to institute. I did more hands-on facilitating of the conversation by saying things like, the next person who will speak is going to say something about what Lenico just said. So put down your hands if you don't have anything to say about what Lenico just said. And then of course, like 99% of the hands went down, right? And then I just sat and I waited. <laughs> For someone to have something to write an idea to share about what Lenigo had just said. And we worked together, right, to start fostering this um, engaging more deeply with one another's ideas and not just with one's own ideas. I also get to um, develop these deeper relationships with the students. So you were asking earlier if Janice gets to see the kids year after year, and right, because her position is different from mine, she doesn't always get to do that sometimes. I get, so some of my fourth graders I've had since kindergarten which is such an incredible treat, right? To see them grow up from such tiny humans, you know, <laughs> to these fourth graders. Um, and you know, I'll walk down the hall and kids will regularly yell, Dr. Philosophy! And I'll say, how do you not know my name yet? And we'll right, have like this whole exchange around that, right? Sometimes they just make up names for me. The second graders, when they were second graders, who called me Dr. Carrot, now call me Dr. Carrot, fourth grade, right, like their teacher is pretty upset about it, and I say like, no, that's just what they call me, they call me Dr. Carrot, and that's okay with me, it goes back a couple of years, right, we, you know, do some little side hugs in the hallway, um, and they identify me, I think many of them as a person who brings something positive to their day, like when they see me around the school, it picks them up a little bit, right, I'm, I'm a person they can rely on, I engage with them as an individual. They get really upset and jealous if I'm heading to a different classroom. Like, oh, they're not coming to us today. And that's a really lovely thing too, right? And, and I think it's made possible by being able to have a program like this where I can be there a lot over years. Um, so another way, so aside from developing these deep relationships, is I think that the philosophy offers up a space to talk in a different, sort of less didactic way about contentious issues. 
Um, so a pet peeve of mine is I feel like so much of kids' quote unquote moral education um, at school ends up being about giving unreflective lip service to various ideals, right? So always share, never leave anyone out, bullying is bad, we should take care of the environment, and they can like say these things. Right, but they leave people out all the time. They fail to share all kinds of things. Right? I mean, come on. Right? But they're supposed to be able to say these things. And one of the things that philosophy can do, not always to the pleasure of the teacher, um, is disrupt. Right? Some of this. And so I go in and I say things like, you know, is there anything we shouldn't share? Let's talk about what we shouldn't share. Right? And we have those kinds of conversations. Or I ask, would it ever be permissible to leave someone out of a game? Let's think about talking about together about the safety of communities and inclusivity, but also the dangers of inclusivity, right? And there might be reasons why some subset of people want to play with each other and not right other people or what have you. Not all of it's pernicious, some of it isn't. And so we can sort of with philosophy disrupt these things. Uh, and ask certain kinds of questions. They love it, for example, when I tell them to yell really loud <laughs> and break the no yelling rule. They get really excited about that. Uh, and I think this is made possible in part because we're doing philosophy. So we're thinking about it together. It gives us permission to disrupt these norms and ask questions together about them, uh, while also recognizing that we're not going to now go out to the playground and just exclude people because we feel like it. Right? That's not what's we also get to talk about things like gender norms in very interesting ways, right? And so um, you get these usual discussions about assumptions about what boys are like and what girls are like on this very binary conception of gender. But when we talk some more philosophically about gender, for example, you'll get kids saying really interesting things about why boys get made fun of for wearing pink but girls don't for wearing blue, right? And what's going on? Right, around ideals around masculinity and how that plays out in gender identity. Right? And then philosophy carves out this space to have that more complex conversation about those things. Um, some of this has come up today uh, also right, in other talks but that philosophy plays with a hierarchy in the classroom right? about who knows what, who should take up space talking, who answers the question. This plays out at the teacher level, right? Because anyone who does this work knows, right? I don't have the answers. Their teacher doesn't have the answers. Um, and in fact, I was doing a session with some kindergartners a few weeks ago, and we got on the topic of what color our skin is. And the kids, we went around, and they all said what color their skin is. And they had these beautiful answers. I'm peach with a bit of vanilla. I'm, right? Nobody used a racial uh, language for skin color. But then the instructional assistant said, I'm caramel. And all the kids said, mm mm, that's not caramel. And he was upset, right? Because he identifies as a caramel colored human, right? But, and so we had to talk a little bit about whether we're in a position to tell other people what color they are. But I, what I really enjoyed was that the kindergartners felt comfortable sort of challenging, right, the adult self description in this way, right? Because Philosophy disrupts this, the hierarchy and switches things around. Um, and we also see this in the group discussion, the big group discussions, because it's not just the privileged kids who have the answers to the questions. Right? So, so often when they're talking about math or literacy or science, it's going to be these more privileged kids. This is a school where you can really see how early childhood intervention impacts people's educational lives moving forward. Right? And um, in philosophy, we all have thoughts. Every single one of us have thoughts. And we don't have to get our head up first to share those thoughts, right? And so um, that can be really frustrating for the high achieving, more privileged kids. They get very annoyed when they aren't called on. They get very annoyed when their ideas can be shared. They cry. They cry. They actually cry, right? Um, having your privilege challenge is hard. <laughs> right? And, uh, but philosophy creates space for that to happen for all of us. Um, and it's the, it's the chance for the kids who do struggle with math and do struggle with literacy to show that they know things, to show that they think things, to show that they have questions and ideas and concerns just like everyone else. I have a student now in third grade whose name is Jermaine.
Jamel, who when I met him in first grade, when I would come in to do philosophy, Jamel could not sit with the philosophy group. He was usually underneath the table on the other side of the room, often had to be removed from the room. And I was very scared for Jamel's future. Um, but he has gotten some interventions, and now he sits right next to me during philosophy as a third grader, and he participates. And so Jamel, who went from the kid who sat underneath the table, right, and no one saw us contributing very much to their community, is now, right, able to, through the hard work of his teachers and himself, no doubt, uh, participate in philosophy and show, right, his great thinking. But it also plays out these great ways for kids. So one year in fourth grade, I had a, a girl named Aisha, who um, is black and wears a hijab. And she uh, kept wanting me to write Dr. Aisha on her name tag. So I did. I wrote Dr. Aisha on the name tag. Well, I don't care. Right? So I wrote Dr. Aisha on the name tag. And then uh, she started sitting up front with me. And then she started helping me read the stories. And then she started helping me facilitate conversation. And so it was like the Dr. Karen and Dr. Aisha facilitated session. And we can do that in philosophy, right? We can just be like, yeah, sure, whatever. You're Dr. Aisha. Come on, hang out. And it was a really lovely, lovely thing. Um, so I don't have a community ball, but you bet I'm going to get one or make one. Um, but I do do a lot of, of decentering in my efforts to, all right, so I have kids pass it on. Right? So I have them call on each other, which then creates this, the boys want to call the boys, the girls want to So I have to intervene occasionally. Um, I have a student named Sue who's entirely in it for passing it on. So he, he like shares his thinking super quick and then says, but this is like what he's into with philosophy, is, is the passing it on. Um, so I'll use uh, their sticks, sticks, the teachers have cups with sticks with their names, and I use those to call on people and try everything I can do to sort of make it a more equitable conversation that's not dominated by certain students. Um, I also think that one way that philosophy can address some of these equity issues is it's available during their day. So it's not something that like the more privileged parents take their kids to after school or on a Saturday. It's right there in their school day, which is right, made possible through the great work of the UW Center and the people who donate and what have you to make it possible for us to be there during the day. It's so important that we be there then and not some other time because a lot of these kids aren't going to have access to these sorts of things if it's not during their school day. Um, and it, it makes it possible for everyone to work on skills. Um, and I also, I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this. I, I hope, and I don't, this, I'm still thinking about it a little bit, but that some of the work we do in philosophy is maybe less subject to some of the damages inflicted by structural racism and sexism. Maybe because um, if you're a student and your literacy level is below average, you will be put in literacy groups with other kids in your level, right? Um, because you're building your literacy skills, maybe you're working less on the critical thinking parts of literacy, you're working more on the mechanics of literacy, right, to get you up to the, the testing level so that you take the test, right? You'll have the right kinds of results. But philosophy doesn't work like that. We all sit together, we all think together, we're all in a community of equals together. It's not stratified in this particular way, right? Um, and they do notice stratification. So one day in philosophy class, we talked about their reading groups. They're called line blocks, because the John Muir mascot is line. And the kids said, the kids who are in the lower level reading groups, who are predominantly kids of color, said, well, we're in the dumb group. It was heartbreaking. And their teacher shut it down right away. I wanted to have that conversation. I know Debbie's going to talk about this a little bit too later, right? When you want to lean into this very uncomfortable thing, and sometimes the teacher, not through ill will, they're just heartbroken. They're heartbroken to hear their students say, we're the dumb kids, because we're in the lower level reading group. It's not ill will. But I feel like, right, there's a conversation we could have there. It did get shut down by their teacher that day. But one of the things I thought about is that doesn't happen in philosophy. Nobody sits here and is in the dumb group in philosophy. We're just all here together. Some of our ideas are great, some of our ideas need some work. And that's as true of me as it is of them. And so, um, I hope that there's a way in which philosophy is less subject to some of these de-duplications of uh, structural racism and whatnot. So now I'll just talk to you a little bit and think with you a little bit about some of the complications 
of doing philosophy in this setting. So part of it's classroom management, right? Uh, I'm trained as a philosopher, not an early childhood educator, and I will not lie, I struggle sometimes with classroom management in this setting. Some of these classrooms are deeply complex in their dynamics. And so I have to learn from the teachers. I've learned quite a bit from the teachers over the year. Um, I've had things thrown at me. I've had kids throw things at each other. I've had uh, kids punch each other. Um, and so uh, I do think there's opportunities for more cross-pollination between professional educators and philosophy for children practitioners, where we learn from them how to do their craft, right? That, that many of them are so very good at. Uh, and it is a struggle. And, and I'm in a school where many of these kids won't have eaten breakfast, right? They, because even though it's subsidized, they won't have made it to school on time for breakfast, right? Um, they're struggling very, very serious right, issues, and so they're, they're not always going to be having their best day, uh, which can make philosophy complicated. And there are days where I will walk out of the classroom and wonder, do I do anything at all today? Right? Um, I feel like I'm not supposed to say that out loud, but it's true. It's true of the work, right? We all know this, right? Okay. All right. Janice says it's okay. So Janice says it's okay. All right. <laughs> So um, another complication is that the English language learners are often pulled out of the classroom, and they are often pulled out during philosophy because they can't be pulled out during other subjects, right? And so all of you who teach it on here, right? And so I will often lose five English language learners who I never get to do philosophy with because that's when they get right their one-on-one -on -one or their small group language. But then on the flip side, when there are English language learners in the room, uh, this is partially why I'm so inspired by Amy's bilingual work and multilingual work, because would that I spoke something other than French and English? Um, if I spoke in part, I'd be in great shape by John Muir, but I don't. And so um, sometimes I have children who I quite literally cannot understand. And here's what's great about philosophy is that they raise their hands and they contribute. So I had a kindergartner named Siong who came from Ethiopia and spoke not one word of English. And she would raise her hand during philosophy and she would answer. She would try to participate with us, right? I unfortunately couldn't understand her. Fortunately, there was another kindergartner who could, who then translated, which put an unfair amount of labor on her, for sure. Um, but we tried to make the best of the situation, but my lack of both training with working with English language learners and also my lack of language skills is um, a liability in such a diverse environment, and that is inescapable. I had a small little moment of triumph, which I think is important from an equity standpoint. In my third grade room, I have two young girls who speak Spanish, and they almost never participate. I, I almost never hear from them. I try but I, I have not so been very successful getting them in. And one day I put the um, kids in pairs, and I happened to overhear them. They were talking to each other about philosophy in Spanish. And um, Amy can nod vigorously from her screen. My Spanish is terrible. I try it on Amy all the time, but it's, it's terrible. But I have a little bit. And I understood a little bit of what they said. And I said, oh, are you talking about this? And their faces lit up. And one of them, Anna, started talking. And then that day, she drew me a picture of me with a heart on it, and she handed it to me. It's going to choke me up. But I thought, like, I could reach out to you, so this made a difference, right? If only I had the language skills to do this with all of the kids, right? It made such a difference to her that I paid attention to what she was saying, right, when she was doing philosophy in the ways that worked for her. Um, so one of my former projects is trying to learn Spanish. So that I can at least do better for the Spanish speaking kids at the school. Things can happen for me. Um, and then here's another thing that complicates uh, I think my work there is I am a white woman. This is a fact about me. Uh, in my academic work, my my own philosophical work, I'm an intersectional feminist. And so I have some strong theoretical ideas and and background in thinking about 
I had a very rude awakening one day at John Muir, um, where sometimes I think it's a great idea to talk about race, and it's not. So I, shortly after the 2016 election, keeping in mind that this is a community of children deeply impacted by our political choices in this country, uh, many of whom didn't know if their families were going to be torn apart, didn't know if they were going to be deported. We were having conversations in the hallway about what to do if ICE comes to the building and how we're going to round the kids up. I mean, these were genuine conversations we were having at the school. Um, the kids were devastated. And I was standing in the hallway with a copy of The Other Side, by Jeff Woodson, and, uh, which is a story about the segregation in the South. And I was excited to talk with them about this book. And by the time I made it into the room, um, I think the kids had seen me in the hallway with the book. The teacher told me that the kids had expressed some very intense discomfort to her about us doing that book. And so I asked the kids about the discomfort. And many of the kids of color in the room spoke up saying, it's just too hard. It's intensely uncomfortable. And I think philosophy is great because it makes us uncomfortable, but I also think there's discomfort, and then there's discomfort, right? And this was the kind of discomfort that I had, was not going to solve with a philosophical conversation. And um, I, I did something else that day. Uh, we did one of David's wonderful exercises that tends to right, be philosophical and put everyone in a joyful mood. And I stole from David on the sun of fly, had his book in my head, and I did something with them that would be philosophical and joyful with them. But I realized in that moment, in a way that all of my academic reading, you know, hadn't taught me uh, in a very concrete way, that it's different for me as a white woman than it is for them as kids of color. I can have a conversation about race and I can go on about my day. And um, as people of color, they, they can't move on in that way, uh, right? They live racism every single day of their lives. They hear their mothers in their jobs being yelled at at the store to go back to their country or stop being a terrorist. They, this is their day-to-day -day experience. And so uh, that incident raised some really important questions for me about the complexities of doing the work. Um, what are we doing to the kids of color when we have philosophical conversations about race, right? Is it always a good thing for them to have those conversations? Um, is it at all beneficial? I can see how it's very beneficial for the white kids. Um, I, and, um, but it's not 100% clear to me anymore how beneficial it is or how to make it beneficial for everyone who's in the room. It's more complicated than I initially thought it was even though I go in with the best of intentions. Um, asking myself questions about what role a white facilitator has in a diverse school community, right? Um, and how, whether I have the relevant expertise to facilitate that conversation in a way that's safe for everyone, given my positionality as a you know, privileged white woman. So that made me think about right, I, what I'd like to see to help to happen to help grow the community, right? To help grow the philosophical community together. Here are three projects I have that I'd love to do. Um, I'd love to start working on generating facilitators from within those communities, right? The communities that these kids come from, right? People of color, immigrant communities, particularly women from within those communities. And I would love to have the time and the financial resources to to get that work done, to, right, to really go out into the community and build um, facilitators who come from within these kids' communities. It's not to say I don't have a place. I do, right? I think I do good work at the school. It's just to say that there's other, I'd love to see other people, and I'd love to see the kids see people who look like them doing the work, too. Um, I'd love to have more time to interact with the parent community, right? And I'd love to live in a world where the parents work so strapped that it's hard for them to get to things at the school, right? Um, and I would love to have the opportunity to engage even more deeply in their daily life, right? Be at the school and have like a doctor philosophy office. <laughs> Dr. Aisha can sit there with me and we can, you know, and so that when a teacher is doing some persuasive writing assignment, they realize they've hit some kind of a wall, they can just call me and say like, hey, 
come on up here, let's do some philosophy to help move us past this, right, or what have you. So I think there are ways, right, to overcome some of these challenges or to grow, and I certainly have individual work I can do to become better at, at handling some of those complexities. Um, but those are my thoughts, such as they are, about the wins and the hardships of doing the work. Couple of questions before we get between get to the lovely lunch that's over here. Um, uh, thanks for your talk. Sounds like a really interesting program. Uh, I'm not a philosopher, so forgive me if uh, I don't know the right terms and whatnot. But the way you portrayed it is you're kind of the fun, crazy aunt in the school who 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 kind of brings philosophy to bear at times to time, from time to time. And on the one hand, that, that sounds like a really positive add-on at the school, but, but I also got the impression much of what you do should be what the teachers should be trained to do. And so many of the things you talked about, like rather than didactic teaching, you sort of bring in much more, hey, let's reflect on our assumptions critically. Uh, let's use certain moments as key teaching moments to open up the broader issues. And so I'm, I'm just curious if, like, by being Dr. Philosophy in the school, you're leading to this compartmentalization or ghettoization of good teaching or philosophical teaching. And I guess my related question is, ideally, you're having an institutional impact on, on the pedagogy that's happening in the school. And so do you think that's happening? Do you think sort of by being there, affecting how the teachers are doing, doing their teaching and their job. Yeah, so I'll do the first, I guess they're next. Yeah, they're right the part. yeah. Kind of two sides of the same point. So I think there's plenty of very excellent teaching that's happening in that school that does all kinds of deep reflection and all kinds of things. The moves, if you will, of philosophy for children, I, I think there's excellent teaching happening. Uh, could our education system get better and do better? Yes, 100%. Uh, but I, I think there's great things going on in those classrooms. But I feel like, so there's the element of what philosophy for children brings that is replicable by a classroom teacher and right, has things to say about how we, about pedagogy. Right? And then there's the philosophy part of it, right? So. Most of the people I know will never just sit around and wonder if they know they have hands. Right? Like, do I know I have hands? This is not a question people ask themselves, right? On a, like, out in the world generally. And this is a weird example to pick, but, right, what ph the philosopher brings to the table is more than just a set of pedagogical commitments to how we should think together, but the philosophy part of it, right? The value of asking questions, the value of asking questions that are uh, uncomfortable but also don't have very clear answers. The value of, we talk a lot in my class about clarification, right? Let's clarify our terms. Philosophers are very careful clarifiers of terms, right? So how are we using the word fair? How are we using the word fun, right? Maybe when I say, what is fun? You don't mean the same thing by fun that I mean by fun, and that's why we're having this disagreement. And that's a particularly philosophical skill, um, and along with many, many <coughs> other things. So I don't think of it as like I'm the sort of like crazy guy who comes in who's more informed or better at teaching because I'm not, right? Um, those teachers are professionals who do their jobs well. I have a particular set of skills, a way of looking at the world, a way of hearing a question, a way of knowing how to drill deeper into it, a way of finding distinctions that I'm trained to do as a philosopher that I then bring with the kids, to the kids, and we work on it together, we do those things all together. And I, I do think that that um, does translate, to answer the second part of your question, to the, the teachers. I, I do think that over the years, I've been <coughs> saying things about their practices changing, and uh, decentering their classrooms more in certain kinds of ways, and being more comfortable with going with the flow with the kids a little bit more, instead of being, um, of course, they have to be agenda-driven much of the time, but some 
letting go when they can't let go. I do think it translates to the school culture more. Janet, do you want to hop in? I see your hand. Well, I was just going to say, and we also do work with the teachers, right? right? So we do PLCs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Standing up here, I can always remember the thing. Right, and so we do do that. Right, philosophy for children is not for everyone. Not all philosophers are going to be good at doing philosophy for children. That's a fact, right? And not all teachers are going to be uh, have the philosophical ear that you need to do it. And so it is about bringing the right people into the room. And then training those at the schools who have it and have the interest for sure. Yeah. Your question. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. 
fun philosophical exercises to bring joy back into the room. Here's that, and then bring the joy back in. I don't know. That's a quarter so, answer. I think there's something like that the pain is, like some pain can be turned as a growth, some pain is just is Like I'm just thinking about the loss of a loved one. Like there's certain times, you know, there's certain things I'm not ready to go from them. And I'm aware that I'm not ready to go, so I don't want to talk about it. So, yeah. Yeah, and this is where I think our relationship with the kids really matters, right? How well we know them, right? I, I think if we don't know them well enough, we don't know where they are with those kinds of things, and so we have to be really a little careful about it. I was just thinking, so in my class this quarter at UW, we read a, basically a story or a philosophical book about trauma and. Part of the point is about the importance of having an audience who will listen, right? Because often people who are suffering from trauma don't even have distinct memories of the details, right? And it comes out bodily or in other ways. And the argument is it's important to have this capacity to learn to narrate the unspeakable, even though in some ways you never get over that, right? It's not so unspeakable. And so I guess I just think this is, it's not quite the same thing, but there's a way in which if there is that level of stress in the students, then it, I agree, you have to be the right person, it has to be the right time, but then it seems like there are ways in which in our classroom space, when we're doing philosophy, maybe bringing in the book about something isn't the thing, but to ask them about what is going on, right? Just, so, so this is to push you back, right, on the same thing Ben's interested in. I agree you don't want to bring in something that creates this level of discomfort and then leaves them with it an hour later. But it also seems like this is the exact moment in this intellectually safe space, it, which is not to say let's sit down and theorize it, yeah. right? but let's try to narrate it. Yeah, it just, I agree with you, and this is what I'm struggling with in part, right? But I always have to remember that I am a faith woman, and so I may not be reading what they're experiencing. So it might, that conversation should 100% take place. And if Mr. Jackson, this incredible black man from within the community who works with the kids and got this whole Black Lives Matter curriculum going into school and who has intense relationships of trust with all of these kids, wants to come in, and have that conversation, and maybe I'm in the room to help with the philosophical yeah. work, or whatever, that feels better to me. Yeah. But I don't trust anymore my, even though I'm a very well-meaning white woman, well-read in intersectional feminist work, right? I'm not embodied in the world the way that they are. And what I think is a rich conversation in a safe space, just, and I am a parent of a gender non-conforming child, and so I know at least on the other side of that, that my kid has been in the room with people, well-meaning people, having conversations about gender that have gone incredibly poorly for him, but didn't look that way to the facilitator, and the facilitator's not embodied in the world the way that my child is, and they had nothing but good intentions. And it was a probably on the outside looked like a great open space to have a safe conversation, but did not feel safe to my child at all. And I'm very aware of that. And so this, I'm with you 100%, like the philosophy practitioner in me wants to say, like, well, we can have this conversation. But boy, does the positionality matter. And I think we got to bring in people from the community and have it in a much more responsible way. I, this is what I think. I'm just in the beginning stages of trying to figure this all out. So I don't want to sound like I feel like I have the answer. But I'm wary of that solution. Is it possible in those situations that they're not ready to talk about theirs? But you're ready to talk about your white positionality in that time with those social regulations being put on them. You have feelings, right? And then you're ready to talk about yours. But is that okay? So to, to speak from your position, to speak from your energy, to speak from your shopping. On trauma about Yeah. Maybe, maybe, and that might be right. And I do, I mean, in that moment when we had this very difficult thing happen, I did say to them, you know, I, I'm, um, this is a kind of learning suffering for me and a, and a kind of discomfort for me 
I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me. I'm not asking you to empathize with me. I, I don't want, I'm not asking you to take care of me, right? I just want you to know that I'm having a moment here of recognizing that something very important has happened and I don't quite really know what to say about it. Um, and so I did try, I, I will admit to have been um, very uh, flustered in my way in that moment, right? But yes, and it, it may be right that I can say some things. Um, and I do sometimes, I call myself out in all kinds of ways in the classroom, right? Um, without expecting them to do the same for themselves. Yeah, and I think that's a really lovely distinction to me. Thank you. Am I supposed to be calling people? I'm sorry. No, I got it. I apologize. I hope this question makes sense. Okay, but um, thinking about like K through 12 education and that like part of the things you have to face is the idea that like we, a lot of teachers have to teach to test for like standardized testing that going on and like philosophy on the level is the counterbalance to that and bringing up the idea of allowing kids to question and like use critical thinking and listening and bringing up closing ideas. Are you ever worried or wonder about if we continue to integrate philosophy <coughs> into K through 12 that will kind of be absorbed? Absorbed into that, like testing culture, or do you, like foundationally, is like. Yeah. I'm not laughing at you or your question. I'm laughing because this is a conversation we have regularly, right? So we're asked, you know, like to quantify the results of philosophy for children, and and those of us who do the work are sort of like, well, we should do that because it legitimates our cause, and at the same time, oh boy, it is a not at all um, unlikely scenario in which, right, that very. Uh, desire to quantify, right, is going to end up, you know, with an s pack philosophy or something, right? And we do not want that. And so this is where the leaders in the philosophy for children movement, you know, are working hard on trying to figure out how to get the credibility of philosophy for children, how to prove the results of the work, right, but how do you, without it becoming like, oh, every classroom should have this and there should be a test at the end of it. And that is a delicate delicate process that I'm super grateful I'm not solely responsible for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I hate to cut off a fruitful conversation, but our lunch is waiting. So maybe we take some of this into yeah. other conversations and we'll aim to be back after lunch. Yeah, and so we have lunches actually for the presenters today, but there's also a food court downstairs yeah. in the basement of the pub or in the app.